Mes rytų menin, su Mangla Damudrin, Mark Aranha, Indra Varmaji, Mr. Keki Daruvalia, distinguished guests, friends, students. Um, on behalf of the trustees of the Sarvodhya International Trust, the Delhi chapter, it is my privilege to welcome you this evening, of, of, to this evening of collective remembrance and reflection, and it is titled Protests of Peace. How do we remember the apostle of nonviolence who fell to an assassin's bullet in January 1948, 70 years later? So much has happened to our nation and the world since that fateful day. We often invoke the spirit of ahimsa, satya, asteya, asangraha, samnayasa, and so many such ideas that Gandhiji himself drew from the Gita to weave the theory and practice of what he called the relentless pursuit of truth or satyagraha. Joan Bondurant had referred to it as the conquest of violence, this unique philosophy of action that Gandhiji had bequeathed to the world and many of his apostles like Martin Luther King and the Dalai Lama sought to emulate in different contexts. I don't know if you're aware, uh, this is not perhaps the platform to share this with you, but in some senses it is that every day Every year during the Tibetan New Year at Losar, there is a prayer that is uh, sent out to enable the Chinese to lift the veil of ignorance from their eyes so that they can be more compassionate towards minorities. So it's that kind of a separation between the so-called oppressor and the, and the act of oppression that Gandhiji tried to bring a sensibility to. Um, today, we choose to remember him as one whose call to action reflected an alternative perspective on politics and an alternative perspective on development. Alternatives to one that our world perilously has embarked upon, the results of which are palpable today. Gandhiji's was a perspective that transcended our reductivist and conventional binaries. The binaries of the private versus the public, of the insider and the outsider, of legality versus justice, of law abidingness versus transgression, of victim versus oppressor, the masculine versus the feminine, and above all, of participation versus protest. In fact, Gandhiji changed the meanings of it, what it meant to be revolutionary in the early 20th century and beyond. In fact, his was a struggle, as we all know, on all fronts against hegemony, the monocultures of the mind, the arrogance of certitudes, and the tendencies to homogenize, colonize, suppress, imprison, and conquer materially, militarily, culturally, socially, or even ideologically. It stood up against the crudest constructions of non-reflexive jingoism and the cultures of militarism of all hues. As he himself said, he did not want his house to be walled in on all sides and his windows to be stuffed. He wanted the culture of all lands to blow about his house as freely as possible. And he said, and I quote, mine is not the religion of the prison house, but it is proof against insolent pride of race, religion, and color. He could well have added gender. So here he was, here in him we saw an explicit acknowledgement of the need to celebrate diversity. On occasions such as this, what is often less acknowledged 
are Gandhiji's perspectives and ideas of the power of women, or should I say the feminine principle, in the manner in which he contoured his alternative politics. <coughs> the paradox of what we read about today in uh, the Tao of leadership, what is soft is strong, because what is flexible and ever-flowing can wear down, like water, the hardest of rock. That, in some senses, is the paradox of leadership. It's ever-flowing and it can wear down the hardest of rock. Gandhiji's views on women are complex and from some feminist perspectives problematic and indeed controversial, especially around issues of female sexuality. But this much is clear. He was committed to absolute equality between the sexes in many senses. He described women as morally superior to men and as the best possible foot soldiers of his own nonviolent army. He sought their liberation from domestic drudgery and sexual subordination and slavery and was indeed the first to encourage, rather exhort them to participate and engage in the public sphere and the political arena, and it was owing primarily to him that Indian women participated in the national movement in large numbers. And interestingly, as a Millie Graham Pollock, an intimate friend of Gandhiji wrote, he too tried to internalize as many qualities of womanliness into his own persona as he possibly could. Qualities of faith, fortitude, care, devotion, patience, tenderness, and great empathy. I, I don't mean to essentialize womanhood, but it was really a statement against muscular politics, not masculinist politics for him. And as you know, the famous book by Manu Ben, where she, she, which was titled Bapu, My Mother. It's an interesting book, I think, if you can get hold of it, it'd be worth reading. Uh, he wrote extensively on the issue of what today we might call euphemistically women's empowerment in young India. And he spoke in the late 1920s and early 1930s extensively on this. In fact, in a talk to women ashramites in 1926, he said, and I quote, a man should remain man and yet should become woman. Similarly, a woman should remain woman and yet become man. This means that man should cultivate the gentleness and discrimination of women, and women should cast off, and woman should cast off her timidity and become brave and courageous. And he brought women's artifacts and items that belonged largely in the private sphere as powerful symbols around which he wove the ideas of freedom, resilience, courage, and independence, and you all know, salt and khadi. He flipped the conventional symbols of valor and masculinity and feminized them. In many ways, women who have waged peace over the centuries have done precisely this. They have created new metaphors of engagement, a new idiom that speaks evocatively against war and the cultures of militarism and muscular politics, foregrounding their own distinctive language and ideologies and creativity and vibrant modes of expression against entrenched cultures of impunity and cultures of silence. And we all know that from the time of Aristophanes' heroine Lysistrata had announced a sexual strike in 411 BC to bring the men of Athens and Sparta to end their war, women have employed novel ways of protest and resistance, underscoring the power of nonviolence. Women at the Greenham Commons, for example, protesting against uh, in a missile site, pinning the diapers of little children on the fence. The Wajir group in Kenya, where the women processioned in the nude to, to raise issues of disappearance of combatants and non-combatants to the state. Uh, the mothers of disappeared uh, children, disappeared people in Argentina, in Sri Lanka, even in India. 
and the women in black in Jerusalem. They are legion, but very often they are invisibilized in the meta-narratives of war, nation building, and security. Closer home during Gandhiji's lifetime and after, from Kasturba onwards to Aruna Safali, Meera Ben, Sushila Nair, the women of the Chipko movement much later, the protesters at the Baliapal missile site, Koel Karo, Kudankulam, through the Bhopal gas pirit Mahila Andolan, to the Narmada uh, agitation, and the Imas of the Mira Paibis in Manipur at the Kangla Fort to Iram, Iram Sharmila and onwards, women have cast aside the conventional image of women working for peace as the woman in white with a fall Florence Nightingale lantern, passively holy or wholly passive. Peace with justice has been their clarion call. And like Gandhiji, who asserted not just the right but the duty to stand up and fight injustice and seek not just, not just retributive but restorative justice, this is the way that women have waged peace. So, so what, is, what is called waging conflict non-violently, women have uh, turned to new pathways of action and protest. And who better to speak to this than our guest of honor, Ritu Menon, whose talk today is aptly titled, When Women Wage Peace. But before I formally introduce the uh, speaker, our, our honors guest of honor, and also the performers for this evening, I would like to extend a special welcome to Professor Sumangala Damodaran and her colleague and co Mark Aranha, who will be singing resistance for us this evening, following Ritu's talk. Professor Damodaran will contextualize each piece, introduce its relevance to nonviolent action, our own history of the anti-colonial struggle, and the voices that stand up against oppression and discrimination the world over. And now for the formal introductions. I will not re read their biodatas because it will go into several, several pages. But Ritu Menon is a feminist publisher and writer. She's probably one of the first publishers of a feminist journal with more than a dozen books and scores of academic essays to her credit. She's the author of the groundbreaking 1998 book, Borders and Boundaries, Women in India's Partition. In fact, it is a book that shook a lot of us out of our complacency, made us look at our own history very, very differently from the vainglorious uh, kind of narrative that is often passed on. And she, it, this made an impact on partition historiography. And she also co-edited No Women's Land, Women from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, right on the partition. All her work on India's partition proceeds from a feminist perspective. She has co-authored several multi-volume studies, especially on the status of Muslim women in India. She has been active in the national, regional, and international women's movements for over 30 years, collaborating closely on research projects, alternative media initiative with women's groups across South Asia. We're all grateful to her, to her because she gave us a new language to understand the realities of gender, violence, and the partitions. Uh, a, a completely new language and a new perspective. She was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2011. Uh, a very, very warm welcome, and we are honored to have you in our midst. Uh, I'd also take this opportunity to introduce Sumangala. Sumangala is a professor of economics and development studies and popular music studies at Ambedkar University. She's also a performer and has been involved with research and teaching in popular music studies. Uh, she has established, uh, the, she has links with the uh, with the f with the contemporary representatives of the People's Theatre uh, uh, movement, which really swept uh, the the revolutionary uh, discourse in 1940 and. 
50 in our country. It was the traditions of Ipta is something that she works on. And she has an album titled Songs of Protest. She has also collaborated with poets and musicians from South Africa. And it's apt that she should have had this connection with South Africa, especially today, because we all know Gandhiji's own connection with South Africa. Um, and she has, uh, she's currently engaged in a, in a project uh, where, which looks at music and migration and, and also looking at the symbol and the substance of lyrics on freedom, articulation and creativity. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to you and to your co-star, Mark Aranha, who's a versatile Delhi-based guitarist and composer who plays an eclectic range of styles. He was formerly a marketing professional and his passion for music led him to Swarnabhumi Academy of Music where he studied under several great jazz musicians. Mark has over 15 years of playing experience, although he hardly looks more than 16 himself. <laughs> and in, it, this includes the electric guitar, the steel and nylon string acoustic guitar. His acclaimed projects for which he has co-written and arranged music are Ditty and Mark and the Underknowns. I don't think he's underknown at all. A very warm welcome to you. And may I now request Indraji and Keki to felicitate our guests this evening. Thank you.